how to improve student learning, we're focused on practical strategies specifically for improving student learning. And as I mentioned in my previous program, previous conversation with you, whenever, I, whenever I'm going to present a session or a course or a class, I begin with the most foundational concepts and I do a, let us say, brief conceptual analysis of those key organizing ideas that should guide everything else that I'm doing in the course, or in this case, in a brief session. So I begin with my title, our, our title for today, Practical Strategies for Improving Student Learning. Now, this is a popular title. It's one that we have been uh, focusing on and developing for really throughout the life of the Foundation and Center for Critical Thinking for over 35 years. And many educators uh, come to this sort of session, this title resonates with them. And I ask why? Well, it resonates because of course we're interested in improving student learning. To think of, to, to sort of unpack this conceptually a bit, let's look at two parts of the, the, this, this topic. Specifically, let's look at improving student learning and how it makes sense to think of that, and then practical strategies uh, separately and then bring the two together. So to improve student learning, what we mean by this, I think, is that we want to help students learn to better think through our content and to reason better through the problems and issues that professionals and theoretician and practitioners deal with in a given field or in our field as teachers. In other words, we want students to learn more deeply as they're learning within our content. There are multiple ways of, of articulating this, but we know that we're looking for deep learning. We know that we're looking for transformative learning. We know that we want students to become better at critical thinking, and that's why we're here uh, together in this, in this critical thinking community. So we have a basic starting place for what we're looking for there. But we can, of course, go much deeper in, in this conceptual analysis of improving student learning, which we'll be doing as we move forward today. But let us think of the, the concept of practical strategies for a moment, specifically focusing on the concept of practical. Now, often when, when teachers think of practical strategy, strategies, they think of simple strategies, easy strategies. Uh, easy ways into a topic, simple things that we can do to test uh, whether our students are learning what we want them to learn. Practical strategies, we want something that, that we can use in practice. So these, these uh, are, what, what, I'm, what I'm doing here is illuminating some of our, some of the ways in which we think about practical strategies that may lead us astray. Practical can mean or can be used in different ways here. We may mean things that are realistic, strategies, ideas that, that are sensible for use in the classroom to achieve our purpose. So, we, and we can also think of practical in a slightly different way, and that is thinking about it in terms of practicing, that is, um, taking an idea and practicing using that idea over and over again, let's say, in order to develop in a given skill area. So we can think of these ideas as needing to be both realistic, given what we are trying to do as we are attempting to improve student learning, and, in, and enable us, enabling us to use certain methods over and over again, as John Henry Newman would say, a few things well, 
not many things badly. That is, that should be our aim as teachers, to come up with ways of practicing intellectual work that are basic and foundational and practical and sensible and realistic and as, if you will, simple as possible in this way. When we are practicing in any, in, in, if we want to develop in any field, let's say in, in athletics, we know that we're going to have to practice the fundamentals within that field, within that, that athletic field, over and over again. And we, are, we, we excel to the extent that we are willing to take the foundational principles and put them into practice over and over and over again. But we don't need and we don't use in, in, in athletics uh, many complex uh, moves until we get to much higher levels. And even then, the best, let's say, tennis players are those who are very good at practicing, practicing the fundamentals. So take basketball. There are certain moves that you need to make over and over again if you're going to be good at basketball. You don't need to make many, many, many moves and lots of different kinds and lots of song and dance and lots of backflips and lots of strategies. No. You need a few things that you do over and over again. For instance, if you're going to be good at playing basketball, you must be good at uh, layups. You must be good at free throws. You must be good, if you, if you want to really be good, at three-point shots. So if you want to be good at these three things, what do you do? You run certain drills for yourself over and over again thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And this sort of thinking is what we, want, what we must do if we are in, in thinking about thinking, if we are going, going to cultivate practical strategies for deepening student learning within our disciplines. Notice it's important to be able to move in and out of these words. I know the title for today was Practical Ideas for Improving Student Learning. So I placed here before you practical strategies for improving student learning. Why? Because we don't want to get stuck in one word, one idea, one pattern of thought. We need to be able to use it words interchangeably and know when we need to use a given word and when another word may be slightly better. So now let's then look at this. Let's go back to our, our improving student learning concept then. We know we need practical strategies. We, we know that we need a few very good ones that we use over and over again. We know these strategies need to be realistic and, uh, and they need to be feasible to bring in another intellectual standard. But what then are we aiming for when we say that we want to improve student learning? Once we figure that out, what we're looking for in student learning, then we'll be ready to ask ourselves, what are, then are some of these practical strategies? Now, I would like to look at uh, a quote, a couple of quotes right now to bring us into this concept. And as you may recall, I am beginning each of my conversations and ending each one with quotes from distinguished thinkers throughout history to remind us that critical thinking as we are attempting to articulate it connects deeply with the thinking and the work of the most distinguished thinkers throughout history beginning let us say with Socrates and moving forward with other distinguished thinkers we're bringing into to, to some of these, these programs and that we will be continuing to, to bring in. So the, the thinker that I'd like to begin with appropriately is John Henry Newman. I mentioned him last week and this quote I want to begin with, he is uh, featured, John Henry Newman uh, is featured on the front of our guide, How to Improve Student Learning. Importantly, because we want to convey to the reader, in this case the instructor, that we're reaching for something very deep, 
and therefore not to be led astray by the term 30 practical ideas, right? Not 30 simple ideas, but 30 feasible, usable ideas if you are beginning with a substantive conception of critical thinking. In other words, if you're reaching towards that. So let's look at what John Henry Newman uh, has said that, that, I'm, that I'm quoting today. Um, and I'm going to read this aloud. And it's a little blurry for you, that, for those of you who are reading this. The intellect, I'm quoting now, the intellect, which has been disciplined to the perfection of its powers, which knows and thinks while it knows, which has learned to leaven the dense mass of facts and events with the elastic force of reason. Such an intellect cannot be partial, cannot be exclusive, cannot be impetuous, cannot be at a loss, cannot but be patient, collected, and majestically calm because it discerns the end in every beginning, the origin in every end, the law in every interruption, the limit in each delay, because it ever knows where it stands and how its path lies from one point to another. And I hope you can see from this quote alone why John Henry Newman uh, deserves the place of uh, having written perhaps the most eloquent text ever written on the concept of education and why we need to ensure that we're bringing his work into our, our schools of education so that we're reading the deepest thinking, even if we ourselves don't understand it. So if we were to spend some time unpacking this very dense quote, we would see quickly that we, we, we would have difficulty working through this because of, by its very nature, we should have to struggle to understand what he's saying here. My point then is, I'm making multiple ones, but one is that we see the thinking of a distinguished uh, writer and an educator, and we, can, we, we should take into account this sort of articulation when we ourselves conceptualize how we should improve student learning. So if we're improving student learning in order to achieve this, what John Henry Newman has laid out for us, well, then this is a, this is a very significant task. And if not this, then what? If, this does, if, if John Henry Newman has not articulated here what it, it means to be an educated person, then what is an educated person? Because when we figure out that, then we'll know how to go about improving student learning. Let me take another quote to add to this. This comes from Richard Paul's work, What Every Person Needs to Survive in a Rapidly Changing World. And I'm quoting, a critical education addresses the need for content mastery and deep learning. It appeals to reason and evidence. It encourages students to discover as well as to process information. It provides occasions in which students think their own way to conclusions, defend positions on live issues, consider a wide variety of points of view, analyze concepts, theories, and explanations, clarify issues and conclusions, solve problems, transfer ideas to new contexts, examine assumptions, assess alleged facts, explore implications and consequences, and increasingly come to terms with the contradictions and inconsistencies of their own thought and experience. This is the thinking and alone the thinking that masters content. Now, this is a very powerful statement. If this is what we're reaching for, 
in connection with what we've just read that John Henry Newman says we should be reaching for as educators, if we are reaching for all of these realities in teaching and learning, then what will be these practical strategies we will use to teach this? Because it won't be too simple and we won't be able to solve this. They'll have to be foundational. They'll have to be basic. But we have to realize that if this is what we're reaching for, we need to figure out the steps that we need to take between here, where we are, the reality, and there to where our students could be. So what we want to do is educate the mind through our work, help educate the mind, contribute our small part to the education of the mind. We are saying this is what we are doing. So we are saying something that is bold and that we should be able to back up with our behavior in the classroom. We know through numerous studies that we cannot teach this through lecture and remote and, and rote memorization. We know this. The studies show this over and over again. And still we rely on this form of, of instruction. Still we say, I am the teacher, you listen, you do what I say, you 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 remember this, you regurgitate this on the test, and you will know this. How how does how how are we making that connection for our students? We're not. Because there is not such a connection. Such a connection doesn't exist. To, to develop in the way that Richard Paul and John Henry Newman say we can develop requires this kind of critical education. So we're here today to come up with or to determine or to develop some practical strategies that will move us in this direction. And I would say the first thing that we should do if we really want to develop the minds of our students is to understand ourselves what these deep thinkers are saying. To, be, to, to learn how to embody these ideas ourselves. And we have a thinker's guide in which we are attempting to take powerful ideas, powerful strategies, we're giving a brief explanation of these strategies, and we're, we're connecting them with a substantive conception of critical thinking. Now the guide itself must be understood in as a complete work. So we're pulling out, we'll be pulling out a few of the strategies right during the session to illuminate some powerful um, ideas we can use in the classroom to foster criticality as we help students think through our content. Um, but of course this is only a beginning place and it will feel uh, a little bit like uh, um, that we're getting just a bit of this and a bit of that because we are but we're getting an introduction. So we know that we must go deeper. We know this is only a beginning place. We have in this guide 30 ideas and we've, we've put them together in, uh, in three different really categories. One, the recommended design features. These are uh, design fe features that we believe need to be included in a course on critical thinking, not everyone, not every day, but students need to be able to, we know, um, to read well and to assess their own reading, to assess their own writing, to assess their own speaking, to assess their listening. And these are just some examples. We know that we need to make the work, the course work intensive for our students. We know that if we do decide to lecture, that we should always use an engaged lecture format. And that can be very simple, um, and it can be this simple. 
stop at any given moment while you're teaching and ask your students to simply write down the most powerful idea that they've learned from the last 10 minutes of your talking. And if you want to assess how well you're doing and how well they're learning, then look at what they're writing because that will give you a sense of what's happening in their minds while you're talking. And then that will be, that will, over time, you could experiment and you could determine to what extent are you, is this a good use of your time to be talking or may, or might there be a better way to foster deep learning through content? We can require an intellectual journal or we can, we can, uh, we can offer that possibility to our students. These are, again, recommended design features. And then, this is very important. In our courses, we spend considerable time on our orientation. And by that, mean, I mean something like three hours in laying out for students exactly what we are going to be doing in this class and the kind of thinking we're going to be fostering and the kind of thinking we're not going to be doing and the kind of thinking they're going to be held responsible for. The course is very different when we teach with a critical thinking orientation. Many of the design components you see, and in fact all of the ideas, no, this is a correction, most of, if not all of them, have come from our work, meaning my work, and Richard Paul's work directly with students in teaching them courses. Of course, we've made modifications to uh, for, our, for more general purposes. But all of these strategies are tried and true and come from working with students over many, many years in helping them engage their thinking as they work through content. So in this orientation, because the course is very different that I teach than others may teach, I want students to understand exactly what is expected of them. I want them to understand the syllabus and why uh, we are doing certain things and not other things and why certain kinds of questions are encouraged and certain other questions are not going to be encouraged. Um, certain questions that will be encouraged will be questions about content. Certain questions that will not be encouraged will be questions like, do I really have to do all the things on the syllabus? Um, Give students uh, grade profiles. We'll talk about that a bit. Grade profiles are very interesting, are very important for students because we want students to know precisely what we're looking for in the teaching and learning process. Often faculty will say things like, well, I'm not really sure what A-level, how to really articulate A-level work to you, but I know it when I see it. Well, you may know it when you see it, you see it, but does it, do the students know when, they're, when they see it or when they're engaging in it? So if we don't give them the profiles, how will they know what, how, what, what they're reaching for and consequently how to achieve that? Uh, we have a student understandings form in which students have to sign and agree to every part of the process, and I'll come back to that in, in a few minutes. And... Um, and so forth. So we have a, this orientation. I'm not going to go through all these parts because I want to burrow in on one or two of these elements and these ideas. And then we also recommend daily that we do certain things on a daily basis to engage students while they're in the process of learning. So we have design features coming in. These are things that we're going to be uh, designing in advance. We give the orientation to the course and then on a daily a basis, we've got to make sure that whatever we're doing is working for these students right now because every group of students is different. And so it's just like every, every uh, tennis player is different and every group of basketball players is different. What may work with one will not work at all with another group. And still, basketball is still basketball and tennis is still tennis. Critical thinking is still critical thinking. We still have to engage in that, but sometimes our students, a group of students may be uh, more off, likely to, to become more off task. So what am I going to do tactically to keep them on task, to make sure they're learning at the highest level of skill that they can in my courses? Um, maybe we have the opposite problem. Maybe we're not, we're not uh, challenging the students enough and they need a little more development and so we're not giving them assignments that are quite 
pressing them enough to move to that next rung of criticality. So uh, learning is an organic process. This idea that somehow people are the same and that we can all fit into one grade and and be and be and be assessed according to one set of standards is absurd because human beings are are all over the map. We're all very different, and we want to celebrate that while also requiring certain level of discipline in our courses. Uh, so now we so we have daily emphasis, and we'll come back to this. I want to now burrow into a couple of. Um, a couple of ideas, and now let's just look at this early design feature, this diagram, which I think is, is quite useful. In developing practical strategies, we know that we need, that students need routine practice in internalizing concepts and applying those concepts. And then, of course, there's an assessment piece. And as educators, we're very concerned about this assessment piece. But we can simplify this assessment piece very much when we ourselves understand the relationship between critical thinking and thinking well within our, con our content. And do you see that this, this diagram uncovers this false dichotomy between theory and application because application comes directly from theory. There, there is nowhere else for application to come from. You have an idea and you apply the idea. The idea is a concept. The concept is related to theories. It's a very foundational move. Very basic and very important because when teachers say, well, I don't really want the theory I just really want the strategies, then I, can, then I say, well, then I can't really help you because you don't understand the relationship between theory and practice. What we have right now is a lot of practice in, in schooling that's not based in sound theory. What we need is sound theory, and that's why we begin with these, these quotes from distinguished thinker, thinkers. Because they get us into the arena of deep theory. And we must have this deep theory to, to lead to this deep learning that we're concerned with. So we'll come back to evaluation in, in a few minutes. Let's look then at a couple of strategies and I want to bring us into this. We could focus on teaching students how to assess their reading. We can do that in maybe a future program. We can teach them how to assess their writing. Um, we can talk about that. And I believe we spent maybe a little bit of time with this already. We can teach, we can teach them how to assess their speaking. And this is one we're going to, to focus on in a few minutes. And then we can also teach them how to assess their listening. So assessment then is targeted very strongly in a critical approach to teaching and learning because if students are not assessing their own thinking, then they're not engaged in critical thinking. More specifically, if students are not assessing their own thinking using universal intellectual standards, then they are not engaging in critical thinking. So you or I as teachers, we can assess students speaking and writing and, and listening and so forth, but if they are not themselves assessing their own speaking and thinking and listening, then they're not engaged in criticality. They're not thinking critically, and therefore, they're not becoming educated persons. So um, assessment, self-assessment assessment becomes central to our work in the classroom. Now, there are some very basic foundational strategies that we can use in fostering 
students' ability to abilities to accurately assess their what they're saying. And it is very simply this, students teaching students. Well, you may say, of course, people have been doing this for, for decades. Students teaching students. Yes, Jigsaw Classroom. Yes, students teaching students. Yes. But what is essential to this process and what is often missing is that students teaching one another is is can be powerful as long as they are routinely applying intellectual standards to this process. So what do we mean by intellectual standards? Well, you will know some of them, of course. And here are ones that we highlight most in our work. These we consider essential intellectual standards. And notice how basic, notice how foundational they are, but also notice how often they're violated in student discussions, in these group discussions. So when students are giving, are explaining ideas to one another, I want to make sure that they, I want to help them ensure, or rather adhere to, the relevant intellectual standards. And the first one is going to be clarity, and it will, they will be struggling with clarity as we will all struggle with clarity throughout our lives as humans if we're concerned with clarity of thought, because it's not always easy to achieve. So when our, in our group work, when students are explaining something to another student, we don't want them to do something like this. Now, students pair up, and one of you explain to the other what I just said, and the other say what you think, too. Go. Then I'm listening, and I'm kind of thinking, well, okay, it's okay, but it isn't quite, you know, something is unsatisfying about this. And it's unsatisfying because the students don't have a very good guide for their thinking in, that, in this case because they don't themselves have the intellectual standards to work with. So here is a different set of instructions that would lead us further, we could say to our students. Now, let's, I would like for you to pair up. One of you will be person A and one will be person B. Person A, explain to person B the most foundational idea or the, the, the most powerful idea that I have been discussing in the last five minutes. Here's what I want you to do. State the idea as clearly as you can, and I would like your partner not to comment and ag or agree, but to say, to, to clarify your thinking and to check your thinking based on any other relevant standards here, check your thinking for accuracy. So I might introduce two standards right here. So I'll say part, the partner, person B, person A, you'll explain the, the core idea. Person B, you will question A to help A, person A, develop her thinking. So she's said something, it's sort of rough. That's fine because that's, that's the way it works. The first time it comes out of your mouth, often the idea is rough. And we have, to, we have to, to celebrate that moment. Well, it's something. It's like an artist. The first cut or the first drawing of the face is often very rough. And if you go with that, then you'll just give up. So you have to understand that words in articulating language is even more complicated in this direction. So let's just have our students articulating. Let's create an environment where they're free to just try this. I know that it's hard, and I know that you won't get this right the first time. It doesn't matter. And your partner is there to help you. So now, person A, you'll articulate. Person B, you'll ask these questions. Let's see. Um, I understood this. Th th this is what I'm looking for for person B, for example. Uh, I understood this part of what you said, person A, but I didn't understand this part. I clearly understood this, but not this. Uh, okay, so or you said that, that she said this. I think I understand it, but now <clears throat> I'm not sure that that's what she did say. I'm wondering 
if this piece is accurate, checking for accuracy. That's the thinking I'm looking for. Um, I want my students to learn to speak in this way and to speak in this way every day in my classes and to speak this way as they go out into their lives, lives and to speak this way systematically throughout the day. Because I know that when they do, their thinking and therefore the quality of their lives will improve significantly by implication. So these standards we will always come back to as students and teachers of critical thinking. And the idea of having students teaching one another routinely in class is a very good drill to run. Imagine that we can only run, we are, we are, we are, a, a, we are a, we're coaches of a basketball team and we can only run 10 drills well for the for this semester and we, we can only choose 10 because any more is just going to make things more complicated and we know the five that we always use we're going to use those no matter what no matter when no matter how because these are foundational um, and so this idea of having students teach one another routinely over and over and over again take the idea teach it to the other student ask one another questions then flip roles. It's a powerful idea that we can use over and over and over again every day and when we do our students thinking will improve. Now obviously you're focusing on teaching your content. There's nothing here on what we teach. Hopefully we're teaching significant content and students are reading and and thinking about what they're reading and not we're not just speaking to them but this is one and, and they're not just processing our words. But this is one strategy that we can use. A second strategy is related, and that is, uh, and, and I've, I've kind of ignored this highlighting here. I kind of uh, don't know how to get this to go away for the moment, so I'm still on number two here. <clears throat> group problem solving. By putting students in a group and giving them a problem or issue to work on together, their mutual articulation and exchanges will often help them to think better. Now one of the things that we do when we have students working together in groups, adhering to intellectual standards, is that notice how I'm, I'm focusing here on their mutual articulation and exchanges. Through dialogical reasoning, we are teaching students correction by engaging them in dialogical reasoning. Under this sort of direction, we're teaching our students disciplined thinking while also teaching them to have confidence in the power of their own minds. The last thing I want my students to do is look for the answer in my face. You can always find someone to agree with you. You can always find some teacher to nod. We must reach within ourselves for these answers. But we do this by learning through, in part, by learning through one another, through mutual articulation, through dialogue, through dialectical reasoning, through, if you will, argumentation of the highest sort, disputation. No, I don't see it that way. I see it this way. We disagree. So how can I move further towards you or are you going to move further towards me or is it hopeless right now? And if it is, then why? You see, these are the real questions. These are the real problems that, that we must face. When we disagree, why do we disagree? We're looking at evidence. You're looking at evidence. I'm looking at evidence. Are we looking at different evidence? Do we give some of it more weight? Do I give some of it more weight than you give it? What is what is happening here? Well, when we understand the foundations of critical thinking and are applying them routinely, then we begin to, to develop some of these solutions. I want to mention here 
the online learning process that we are moving towards in this in this uh, global, let's say, as we move towards a, a global educational community, if you will, we have an opportunity to reach people everywhere there are computers now. With this kind of interaction from our central location in Northern California, we can go anywhere in the world if you've got a computer and we can teach you. This is very exciting. This is something we've never had before. But what we see is in this movement towards online learning, there is a great struggle to figure out how to, in fact, educate the mind through the online learning platforms. So moving to online learning platforms is not the question. That's a done deal. We're there. We are already there. We don't have a choice. And if we want to move backwards into brick and mortar, well, that's just too bad. We're moving forward to online learning. But what is the quality of the online learning courses that we're offering this, the universal, universal educational community? And one of the things that we're bringing to the heart of our online learning programs is a deep understanding of universal intellectual standards like clarity, accuracy, relevance, and so forth, and daily use, systematic use of these standards in our courses so that students in our courses, for instance, write papers and give each other feedback on their papers adhering to intellectual standards under our direction. When our on-learning courses move in this sort of direction, we then have some hope to use uh, online learning to, to, in fact, educate the mind, which is our emphasis in, uh, for those of us who are hoping to bring about more just societies through the advancement of human thought. There are other strategies, of course, that we can that we can target, and I'm just going to highlight a few more of these. In focusing on helping students develop their ability to listen critically, there are, there are some very foundational moves that we can make over and over again. Often in our courses, we are still lecturing to students, and when we do take questions, we will um, say something like this, well, who, does anyone have any questions? And then we, we get questions from the same students over and over again, and there they are jumping out of their seats, and there are three of them. And we, we don't really quite know what to do with this, because we know that we want the other students involved, but these same three keep jumping up. And so what we can do is something like this. Tell students from the beginning, I hope that whenever I ask this question, how many, w do you have any questions? That all of you will be ready to, to raise your hand. I hope that you will all be ready. But since I know that you will not all do that, and I will be able to predict who will, what I, and because I'm responsible for all of your learning, to help all of you learn, not just the ones who are, going like this, um, then I'm going to call on you regularly, my students, and unpredictably, un and unpredictably. Now, I'm not arguing that in every classroom, at every moment, we should use this strategy or indeed any strategy with our students. And every strategy must be applied intelligently. So if I have students who are um, have learning difficulties, well, I'll be very careful in doing anything like this. This is teaching and learning must always be, in my view, a relaxing, enjoyable process. I want my students to say, I can't, I just can't wait to get to that critical thinking class. W where are those students? Can't wait to get to that science class. History is the best class I've ever taken. Just, I've done this paper, can't wait to share it with my students and see how I've done. Where are these students? And what, what have we done to, to lead in the wrong direction? 
So we have to be careful in how we set up the climate. So this idea is to be used carefully and cautiously. So when I, when I suggest this strategy, this is the kind of thing I mean. I want my students to understand that all of their thinking matters. And unless I hear your thinking or somehow see your thinking or somehow experience your thinking in some other way, then I won't know what it is. So if it's going on in your head, but you never tell me what it is, then how can I help you? How can I possibly see if you, if you need intervention in your thinking, if there's any, there are any flaws in your thinking? If there are any flaws there, if I don't have any products of your reasoning to work with. So a product of your reasoning would be something that you say to me. So a strategy. So I'll, this is part of, by the way, the orientation process. When students understand that I really care about their thinking and that is why I'm here, they'll tolerate a lot more than students who don't believe that. And they believe it over time if you live it. If you live the life of Socrates, if you live the life of the examined person, if you show the students how great the struggle really is, then they begin to believe you. If you say, look, I don't know a lot of the answers. I know a few things that I think will work well for you to improve your reasoning into thereby improve your life. But I am I am very weak in many ways as a thinker. This is intellectual, this is exhibiting and demonstrating intellectual humility. So first I want to, to demonstrate that I'm a student and that if I call on you, my students, to, to say something in class, then I'm going to give you the widest berth. You'll never, you will never be uh, ridiculed in my course, you'll never be, you'll, well, no one will ever be allowed to do anything that borders lines on sarcastic without me helping them see they've done that and holding them responsible for that. So when I say call on students regularly, I mean do this with good reason, with, 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 um, with good judgment. So I may do something like this. Now, I have articulated the, let's say, the core concept of critical thinking. Now I may say, uh, you know, Greg, would you would you give us your articulation uh, in your own words? And now I may start with a student who I think will do a fairly good job and certainly wouldn't be uh, wouldn't feel uh, sort of alienated or fearful in that case. So I'm going to to ask someone who sort of likes to be first, and then I might ask another student to. Uh, to uh, say in their own words what Greg just said. And if you do this one, if you make this one move regularly in your courses every time you teach, you will find that students, lo and behold, are suddenly much more aware of the discussion because they're having to say either in their own words, what Greg just said, or I really don't know because I wasn't paying attention. In which case we say, oh, that's all right, we'll give you another chance. So we'll go to another student. So I'll say, Rachel, can you tell us in your own words what Greg just said? Of course, when I call on Rachel, I'll know that she will have paid attention. And uh, so you see, this is how it goes, but you see, you're it's a, it's a light touch. You're just saying to them, oh, so you want to be saying regularly in front of your colleagues that you weren't really paying attention? I don't think so. So very quickly, students will be on task. We use the peer pressure to our advantage here. And that's good because it helps hold students responsible for what they're saying and what they're, what they're hearing. So now... I've, I've introduced you to a few strategies from this thinker's guide, and it is how to improve student learning. It's available through our website, criticalthinking.org, and it is based in the principles that we laid down in our 
Critical Thinking Concepts and Tools Guide, which uh, all of our guides are available um, digitally now. So this guide includes our core concepts and uh, it illuminates the, our, the main conceptual sets in our work. All of our thinkers guides are focused on these foundations that will come up again and again in critical thinking in a substantive approach to critical thinking. Uh, and let me comment on this. We, we received a question in our last uh, program, and I want to address this question briefly now. And the question was this, what about other approaches? Why don't you compare your approach to other approaches? And I would say this, I am not looking for an approach. I am not looking for a person's uh, theory. I'm looking to live at a higher level of quality. And I need all the best tools as a thinker to do this because I can see the deficiencies in my own thinking. And what I see here in this framework that we offer through the foundation is an integrated approach that I've not seen anywhere else. Moreover, and most importantly, it connects with all of these concepts in our approach connect with the work of distinguished thinkers throughout history. These are not new ideas, but they're pulled together in new and, let's say, more accessible ways. So throughout history, important thinkers have talked about the importance of clarity in thinking, accuracy in thinking. Important thinkers have written on the importance of articulating your purposes and understanding questions in thinking. And many important thinkers have focused on and illuminating these intellectual and illuminated these intellectual traits. The que so the question is this: When you are seeking an into a, a framework for critical thinking, then look for one of substance and make sure that it it does uh, intimately connect with the most powerful ideas that have been articulated by important thinkers in, in critical thinking, in let us say the field of critical thinking, were we to actually have such a field. Now I want to close with um, another quote by a distinguished thinker. I'm sharing with you my drawing of Mahatma Gandhi, and no one has seen this yet. And uh, this is a close-up of uh, this drawing. It's graphite on acid-free paper. And I'm bringing to you some of his powerful ideas, oops, powerful ideas that he brought to the world. And I want to just articulate these for you because I will enjoy reading this as we close. Silent, this is from Gandhi, quote, Silence becomes cowardice when occasion demands speaking out the whole truth and acting accordingly. There are many causes I would die for. There is not a single cause I would kill for. The difference between what we do and what we are capable of doing would suffice to solve most of the world's problems. The only tyrant I accept in this world is the still, small voice within me. And even though I have to face this prospect of being a minority of one, I humbly believe I have the courage to be in such a hopeless minority. The world has enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. Live as if you were to die tomorrow. Learn as if you were to live forever. A man is but the product of his thoughts. What he thinks, he becomes. Now, if this, if this is what we're reaching for in education, if, if, if Gandhi helps us articulate, along with Newman and Paul in today's program, the educated mind, if this is what we're reaching for when we're hoping to improve student learning, then what will be these practical strategies that we use? Students must 
be introduced to these ideas. They must have an opportunity to discuss these ideas, open their minds to these ideas, articulate these ideas in multiple ways, to say in their own words what this means. What does it mean when we say silence becomes cowardice when occasion demands speaking out the whole truth and acting accordingly? What does that really mean? It sounds very good. And how many of our students could articulate the meaning in a way that then showed us that they were able to use these ideas in their thinking? <coughs> See, the difference between a powerful thinker and one who is a mimic is that the powerful thinking is bringing the ideas into her or his thinking while articulating them. And if I'm a good teacher, I'm a good student. And if I'm a good student, I will take what I'm teaching you today and I will take it seriously for the rest of today, hopefully into tomorrow, and hopefully further. I'll think about these, these arguments that I'm making and I will hopefully deepen my ability to reach students and to, to um, reach my own self with these powerful ideas. I need to close. Again, I hope that you will join us for our upcoming conference and academy. We want to learn with you in person. We look forward to future uh, sessions. And I want to thank you all again for joining us. I'm Linda Elder. I'm the president of the Foundation for Critical Thinking. And we look forward to seeing you at future conversations with our fellows.